a lot of faith in the news media and the way they operate, uh, you know, and the way they present uh, information sometimes. 95% of it is just Thank all uh, <clears throat> stories which are fabricated for, for the sake of selling newspapers and, and the like. Yes, please. If you happen to be part of that news or involved in part of that news, it makes you angry because it's it's um, it's not correct, you know. It just makes you angry. It, it, uh, you think, well, geez, I can't trust none of the buggers. A land and sea search is underway for the pilot of a light aircraft missing in Bass Strait. The plane was on a flight from Moorabbin in Melbourne across to King Island via Cape Otway. Department of Transport officials say the pilot was the only person aboard the single-engine Cessna. When the pilot reached Cape Otway, he reported all was well. But a few minutes later, told flight service he had a rough running in. It'll still be uh, part of the destiny. Well, more or less everybody yeah. got destiny. When you're born, your destiny is already there anyway. You know, you have found are still a very frustrated subject. That's very intangible. You can't touch it. Flying along in an aeroplane, how could you actually pick an aeroplane up and physically take it somewhere? <coughs> it's not possible. I don't know what he saw, but whatever he said that he saw, he saw. Uh, that is more motor control airplane, the little one. Yeah. You know, I started from there. He was only 12 months old, put on this one, he can't understand, more or less, but he loved the noise, you know, up and down. And one day this plane came out from the box and he started to really fly. You know, he jumped a fence, he broke oh, a window, uh, no more, no more, nothing special. Mm. And not a genius, like a people they try to say, oh, he was a genius or something, nothing like that. Sometimes he, he was a good at school, sometimes not. It was hard for him. I mean, you know, like a normal person. The absent, there, yes. Yeah. Corporal Frederick Valentich, the member of the squadron from the 18th of September 1973 to 16th of March 76. During this time, Corporal Valentich proved himself to be a most capable and enthusiastic cadet. It is understood he now wishes to enrol for the commercial pilot course, and to this end we wish him well and have no doubt he will apply the same keenness and efficiency towards this course as he did in his career as a cadet member of the squadron. And I signed it. And these kids are normal kids. They're not... Uh, you know, they come from suburbs all around Melbourne. Our objective as a, for existence is to give young people an insight to aviation. They get an insight to how, what it's like to put the uniform on and spend a week or two weeks living as an Air Force person. Flying was his life, but he had a social life as well. And he worked the two very well. If flying didn't fit in, social life went out. Man in uniform. <laughs> he loved flying. That was... Number one, flying was more important than anything really. Just what he wanted to do, anything he wanted to do, just become a part of like a commercial pilot, fly for the airlines. Probably a month after we'd started going out, he took me just on a, just for him to get some hours up. Went down to Moorabbin Airport and hired a Cessna and just went for a fly. I loved aerobatic flying as well. I took me aerobatic flying. And that was a thrill. It was great. And I took them as we flew up. That was the best one, with the clouds, just looked like a blanket of clouds. I wanted to just jump out of the plane and walk along it. The blanket <laughs> looked so, so solid. And um, we had a few troubles on the way up. He was real calm and didn't worry about it. Aircraft engines, he had a, an interest in the engines themselves. 
airman ship. Yes, he loved flying. He loved it very much. His wish was to go into the Air Force, but he was just a little bit too old. And unfortunately, he, I, to my mind, he gave so much to the Italian court that he missed out on a lot of um, opportunities. He went to fly, night experience or whatever they call, and he booked the plane for four hours. Instead, he, done, he did just an hour and a half or something. And when he came home, I asked why he come earlier. And he said, Mom, up there, is, um, I, got the fi I have the feeling something follow me. I asked him if uh, he's not lonely or in the dark special during the night anyway he said no it's something marvelous beautiful you can see the star you know and i feel really right up there the night before he went missing he was at my place and he did say he was scared of flying over the water but he wasn't he wasn't like scared like the, what the meaning of scared is, as you know, t terrified of. He was more scared of the way he put it was the water. He wasn't a great, uh, I could say, love of deep water. He wasn't a great love of swimming. Well, he was supposed to pick me up. He said 7.30, 8 o'clock. He said, it depends on, you know, how long it would take him to come back. And from King Island. And um, it was 7.30 and I thought, oh, well, you know, he's probably on his way back or whatever. And it got to 8 o'clock and I thought, he'll ring me soon because he used to always ring, you know, and say, I'm, gonna, I'm late, you know, I'm on my way. It's a subject, I suppose, which can easily be sensationalised and uh, distorted. And what has happened is fairly straightforward, really, even though it's extremely mysterious. Foxtrot, Melbourne traffic is below off the mic. I've got a heron. 24 Flinders Island. Only 20 of 187,000 Flinders Island. There is military airspace, military restricted areas associated with Point Cook down in that vicinity, right? Uh, but uh, it was not active. So hence when he said, do we have any uh, large aircraft planned to operate in the area? Uh, and then he mentioned military aircraft. Well, of course, um, it threw us into a bit of confusion because we should have had details on that type of operation. Thanks. Well, initially, I thought what he was saying was there was a large aircraft operating in his, in his area, uh, possibly a military aircraft, and, and why? didn't we know about the aircraft? Well, I went to control. I went to the air traffic controller, the radar controller, and see to see if he had uh, a radar paint on any large aircraft operating down that way. And unfortunately, the, the altitude of 4,500 wasn't high enough to uh, for the radar to pick up anything. What he was seeing was... Uh, was not an aeroplane and was uh, possibly a UFO or some atmospheric phenomenon. He uh, mentioned uh, a couple of green lights, a white light and a red light and uh, a sort of a silver metallic like shiny surface. Mm. That's when it all got very, very uh, mystifying. <laughs> News just to hand. The pilot of a light plane thought to have crashed in Bass Strait last night said just before losing radio contact
that an unidentified object with green lights was heading straight for him. The frightened pilot told air traffic controllers that it was hovering on top of him and that it was not an aircraft, seconds prior to him being snatched away by the UFO. Mr. Valentich, what do you believe has happened to Frederick? Well, I really believe that he must have been struck with certain uh, uh, unidentified objects. Uh, Pilot of the aircraft radioed the Melbourne Flight Service Unit here at Tullamarine and reported he was over Cape Otway proceeding for King Island. Sturgis, what do you think happened to your son? Well, uh, it's hard to say, but well, I really believe that uh, he must be interfered with the some uh, uh, unidentified uh, object. It was at that point that the conversation became decidedly mysterious. It's a fairly far-fetched sort of theory, isn't it? Yes, it is. The but, father uh, of missing pilot Frederick Valentich said yesterday he hoped an unidentified flying object had been involved in his son's disappearance. He told reporters that he'd rather that than find wreckage of the plane. When at first he didn't come, we thought that he had an accident, or right, that he probably fell down in the sky. But then, as the uh, people come along from various newspapers, around about 11 o'clock, some journalist, I think it was from Channel 9, he mentioned to me that he heard about that there was to do with some strange object surrounding him. And when we first heard, that was the first uh, hint that we have about the UFO. And as they tell us, myself and my wife, we felt much more relief because we knew that Frederick always mentioned about the UFO, that he would like to meet one. And our heart really opened up with a great big hope when I heard that, and I was more or less put on this way, don't get me wrong, I was happy. Because I said, at least he's somewhere. That's right. You know, not uh, just uh, not went crash. on a sea or crash or on yeah. a land or whatever. I rang Moorabbin Airport straight away. And they said to me, how are you related? You know, why are you inquiring? And I said, oh, I'm Frederick's girlfriend, if it's Frederick. And then they said, yes, it is. Well, the message I got through was, Fred's gone. I said, yeah, yeah, well, well that's good. Uh, and uh, she said, um, hey, he's gone. I said, well, look, he'll come back. And he said, he's, he probably hasn't gone far, huh? It sort of came on. I realised that what she meant by gone was she meant he'd gone into the bay or he'd gone into a mountain or something like that. And I started to show him. Uh, more signs of life then. Made a few phone calls. I got a call first of all from John Gibbs and he uh, suggested that perhaps I could um, see what I could do. Well, what I did, I rang the uh, Tullamarine people uh, and spoke to people there and then I rang Moorabbin. It was fairly evident a pretty well organised full scale search was to be conducted. <laughs> Yes, I was extremely sad, I can assure you. We were expecting uh, Fred on the night of the 21st of October. Uh, he's coming to this uh, place here for, for dinner. Anne had a salad and he's bringing back some crayfish. I saw someone on the Sunday night and then on Monday, it was the full force of all of them, not just newspapers, it was also like the news for the TV and uh, just came all come around to get their story. I believe the major news areas, news medias, covered it with the information that they had because there wasn't any there. Uh, what was it? The bloke had crashed, had reported the UFO. Where's the story? So they had to dig. I think they wanted, they really thought that I knew what where, where he was, as if I, you know, as if I knew <laughs> what was going on. So, but I only knew from what they had already put in the paper and what I'd heard on the radio. She also denied that she had gone to Cape Otway for the purpose of any secret rendezvous. The UFO reported by the pilot of an aircraft missing over Bass Strait could have been a top secret United States military remote controlled drone vehicle used to decoy radar from an attacking strike force girlfriend away and all these sort of things. There were 
then after we realized that we were all stupid, but at the time, certain people take seriously. Michael, is it possible for a pilot to become so disoriented that he uh, could fly upside down? Yes, it is, and uh, uh, I'd like to make the point that uh, no one knows what has happened in this instance, and we know we can't discount that there was, in fact, a UFO. QM. Missing UFO pilot Frederick Valentich may have crashed while flying upside down, a Department of Transport Authority said today. The department believed it was possible the pilot became disorientated and was seeing the lights of his own aircraft reflected in the water. There's no way that you can lose control of an aeroplane and basically when you do become disorientated, um, uh, it's called spatial disorientation, you've lost control of the aeroplane, uh, you fight to regain your orientation and it, it, it is, you know, it's quite a strange feeling really. Uh, there's no way that you can speak on the radio like he was talking to me. It's not as if it's happening to you and you don't know about it. As he was flying inverted in the fading twilight. Of course, what they failed to mention is a Cessna 182 is unable to fly upside down for longer than two or three seconds without stalling, and the conversation lasted for seven minutes. An actor's recreation, based on the official transcripts, is all that's left of that night's conversation. No one has, has heard the tapes except, except you and a few other select people, but there have been, right. they have taken it down, though, and uh, you, you could, could read, read it somewhere. It somewhere. Oh, oh, yes, yes, yes. they made the transcript, yeah. yeah. So, so he, he said, said he, he cited an object. object. That's right. The Department of Transport is refusing to release its tape recording of missing pilot Frederick Valentich's description of his confrontation with a UFO. The spokesman would not elaborate publicly on why the tape recording of Valentich's final moments could not be released. But a Sydney ufologist told the fourth annual UFO conference that investigators and officials should think before releasing things to the media because it often led to sensational publicity and harassment of the individuals concerned. He noted the sensitivity of the family must be respected. That's when I sort of started to feel that it can't be an aircraft if it's operating like that. Which seems to indicate that he was looking at it and it just disappeared. Twenty-three, twenty-four are the, the power settings for a Cessna 182. So what he was indicating was he had the aircraft set to cruise power and it was, um, as he said, coughing. It was running rough. He was in greater trouble, right? Well, the chances are he may have lost power to the extent where he was unable to maintain height and, of course, would ditch in the ocean. And then the last transmission he seemed to me as if he was right in the middle of his transmission a little confused he got the, his call sign and my call sign back to the front and uh, it seemed he was halfway through his transmission when his communications started breaking and uh, that was the end I suppose I said to myself a couple of times is this real you know and just doubt had it happened, or was it a hoax, conflicting with the fact that it, he seemed so, um, I suppose, genuine in what he was uh, saying. It was upsetting, you know, somebody's obviously uh, disappeared and uh, there's a good chance that uh, they may have died. The mystery deepened last night after hundreds of sightings of UFOs were reported from Geelong, Frankston, Cape Otway, and further along the coast, of which three reports were made up to three hours before Valentich's flight. To him, uh, UFO were a real thing. When he was just young, 15 years old at high school, he was actually having fear, he was scared of UFO. They come and divided the family. As he became more mature and he understand more about, he came back with a certain, with a different 
opinion and a different philosophy on UFO, the last 12 months, he virtually convinced me and my wife of UFO existence. But he's not, never been fanatic. Any aviator has got interest in it. It's an unknown. I mean, I, it's an unknown. But it's flight. You're always interested in it. You saw something. Uh, he reported that something. See, by reporting it, he jeopardised his commercial pilot rating. So there had to be something there. He was a young bloke aspiring to be a commercial pilot seeing UFOs. <laughs> How's that going to look on your record when you go to get your licence? I was quite mystified, extremely mystified. We never ever discussed those kind of things. Um, we kept in no files at Air in Corps headquarters on UFOs. We had other, uh, other things to do. Uh, to me, I have no uh, 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 beliefs in UFOs, although uh, I have no, not a great disbelief. I just don't know. I, I just don't know. You get people that are religious, and uh, they might think, well, if you believe in God, uh, there could be angels, uh, UFO, but not necessarily being evil. Uh, most of the people believe that we are not the only one in this universe. They got to be another civilization somewhere, uh, like in a flying way to say, you know, you, he don't have one limb on a limb on tree only. I believe in, in really in God. I don't know what is God, but I believe something. Sometimes I pray, I say, gee, uh, God give me another 20 years to live. Maybe in 20 years something happen. You know what I mean? Look, even some, perhaps UFO could be something, uh, or American or German or whatever, or Japanese or Russian. They create something and we don't know. We put the UFO name because we don't know what is that. UFO does mean come from other planet. Well, I believe in God, but it's only what you hear, isn't it? It's, it's, the Bible's been translated so many times. I mean, it's just like UFOs, isn't it? <laughs> you don't know if it's real or not. I think he's alive. And I had this, like, you know, you get this gut feeling that he's still alive. But where, I don't know. Because there's no facts there, you know, to say, yes, he, he's dead, you know? Well, all the facts said that if he was in the water more than 12 hours, he'd be frozen to death because the water was coming off the Antarctic at that time of the year. Um, we hoped and hoped, I suppose, for three or four weeks. I've only recently, I think, accepted it. The fact that he is gone, finished, it's over, it's done, that he's dead. I've lost a friend, uh, a good friend, uh, and a good member of staff. And uh, you don't get over those things, really. Uh, you, you never forget. I felt virtually on the night it happened he died. I don't think the aeroplane is anywhere but uh, at the bottom of Bass Strait somewhere. No, never. He's dead. Some people, they try to convince me he's somewhere dead, but I never, I'm not accept, and no. I, ne uh, I never will accept that anyway. No. Well, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't not accept it. You know, he's got maybe killed, but providing that someone comes with a true fact and theory that it did happen, Well, Guido, all I can say is I hope that uh, you keep mm. hoping and I hope that your hopes come true. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if I really want to find out if there are UFOs or not for the sake of mm. finding them, but I hope that you do too, and I hope that uh, okay. you can once again be reunited with your son, maybe. Good. Okay, thanks for coming in tonight. To the world of the occult and take a look at devil worship. And we meet a man whose son was kidnapped by aliens in a spaceship. We'll be back a mystery that's exactly seven years old. The coroner says there's simply not enough evidence to justify an inquest. More in a moment. You will remember that 10 years later, Fred has uh, never been found, but his father Guido believes that uh, his son is still alive, possibly even held by aliens, as mm. some people suggest. Would you please welcome uh, Guido Valentich? 
I wonder if he had been taken aboard a UFO and had come back, would anyone believe him? More in a moment. Okay, roll 16. <laughs> a lot of faith in the news media and the way they operate, uh, you know, the way they present uh, information sometimes. 95% of it is just Thank all uh, <clears throat> stories which are fabricated for, for the sake of selling newspapers and, and the like. If you happen to be part of that news or involved in part of that news, it makes you angry. Because it's it's um, it's not correct, you know. It just makes you angry. It, it, uh, you think, well, geez, you can't trust none of the buggers. A land and sea search is underway for the pilot of a light aircraft missing in Bass Strait. The plane was on a flight from Moorabbin in Melbourne across to King Island via Cape Otway. Department of Transport officials say the pilot was the only person aboard the single-engine Cessna. When the pilot reached Cape Otway, he reported all was well. But a few minutes later, told flight service... During this time, Corporal Balanch has proved himself to be a most capable and enthusiastic cadet. It is understood he now wishes to enrol for the commercial pilot course, and to this end we wish him well and have no doubt he will apply the same keenness and efficiency towards this course as he did in his career as a cadet member of the squadron. And I signed it. And these kids are normal kids. They're not... Uh, you know, they come from suburbs all around Melbourne. Our objective as, uh, for existence is to give young people an insight to aviation. They get an insight to how, what it's like to put the uniform on and spend a week or two weeks living as an Air Force person. Flying was his life, but he had a social life as well. And he worked the two very well. If flying didn't fit in, social life went out. Manning. He had a rough running in. It'll still be uh, part of the destiny. Well, more or less everybody got yeah. destiny. When you're born, your destiny is already there anyway. You know, UFO are still a very frustrated subject. It's very intangible. You can't touch it. Flying along in an aeroplane, how could you actually pick an aeroplane up and physically take it somewhere? <laughs> it's not possible. I don't know what he saw, but whatever he said that he saw, he saw. Motor, motor control airplane, the little one. Yeah. You know, it started from there. He was only 12 months old, put on this one. He can't understand, more or less, but he loved the noise, you know, up and down. Yeah. And one day, this plane came out from the box, and yeah. he started to really fly. You know, he jumped a fence, he broke a oh, window, uh, no more, no more, nothing special. Mm. And not a genius, like a people they try to say, oh, he was a genius or something, nothing like that. Sometimes he 
he was a good at school, sometimes not. It was hard for him. I mean, you know, like a normal person. Yes. Yep. Corporal Frederick Balancic, the member of the squadron from the 18th of September 1973 to 16th of March 76.